I'm Dean Walker, and welcome to the Poetry of Predicament podcast, a podcast for people brave enough to face humanity's challenges and problems, and most importantly, our numerous predicaments. The Poetry of Predicament is a podcast meant to inspire us to bring forth grace, beauty, and connection with the web of life in the face of a predicament-laden world. Welcome to the Poetry of Predicament podcast. In this episode, which is March of 2018, we're going to be speaking with Earth and Paleo climate scientist Andrew Glickson. He's uh, with the Australian National University. And yes, we will talk about his recent book, The Pluto Scene, and we'll talk about his many articles. But more, we'll be talking about his poetry and his way of coping with the dire information that he's privy to, given his work and his science. It should be a great uh, episode of Poetry of Predicament. Join us. Yeah, you you know by now I'm I'm Dean Walker, and uh, I am uh, in a kind of an unusual uh, line of work these days. I've been in the training business for a long time, training executives to work more uh, effectively together, and working with um, training with uh, personal development work with couples for more intimacy, and uh, working with at-risk youth in uh, the UK and the USA, training adults to work with troubled kids. And now where I've ended up is uh, creating a a body of work that is intended to give people a a much more powerful inner toolkit to be able to... um, to face these extraordinary times that we're in. And, um, yeah, all right. Yeah. It's it's very impressive. Yeah. Yeah. So that's really why I wanted to speak with you. I wanted to let you know that, um, you're one of a very small handful of, of scientists in your field that, um, really had the, what I would call courage, to um, to put out the the kind of information that you do, the kind of data that you do, and it also include a very human and uh, a very you know somewhat urgent call to action. And um, you know, unfortunately, there are many- yeah. I really appreciate your comments. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, it's it's uh, I think a, an extraordinary time on on planet earth it's a i think it's a time in human history um that is like no other that's that's been before it and uh it's it's definitely not a time to be uh overly diplomatic or polite um so when someone like you who is an expert in in your field is willing to step up and really uh, tell it like it is i i deeply appreciate it Yes, it's a thankless job so, uh, to um, people know how seriously the situation is. Um, I cannot say I enjoyed it all. In fact, um, it gives me a lot of heartbreak. Yeah, uh, you and me both. <laughs> you and me both. Um, so I, I would like to... Um, just start out, just to give a brief introduction so we can start out the official recording of the interview here. I'm, uh, you know, in this episode of the Poetry of Predicament podcast, really pleased to have Professor Andrew Glickson from uh, Australian National University. He's an earth and paleoclimate scientist and um, author of uh, several books, uh, most recent one I'll mention in just a moment, uh, innumerable articles. Uh, it won't take you long if you go and look up um, the recent articles put, put out by Professor Glickson. Um, I, I, you know, I just lost count of the number of different uh, internet sources for your articles. So that's congratulations on being well-received out there. And I did want to mention the 
uh, Plutus. Yeah, thank you. Uh huh. The Plutocene uh, is your most recent book, if I'm understanding it right, and and the subtitle Blueprint for a Post Anthropos Anthropocene Greenhouse Earth. And quite evidently, that is that where we are. But what we were just talking about a few moments ago is how few, uh, certainly how few climate scientists are really stepping up and, and putting such bold terms on our condition as you are, even in the title of your book. So uh, Professor, and Professor Andrew Glickson, welcome to this podcast and this interview. Thank you so much for spending time with us. You're very welcome. Thank you for your work. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Um, I, you know, I, um, I listened to another interview that you did uh, just a couple of weeks ago, and um, I was surprised to hear you had quite a bit to say about a number of different challenges or possibly even predicaments that we're facing on this planet. And one of them was about the nuclear situation, the nuclear dangers. Would you mind starting there and, and just saying a little bit about what your concerns are with regard to that? Yes, of course. The nuclear started in 1945. Yes. It's easier than the climate predicament. The climate situation been progressing now uh, essentially since 1975 in, in serious but it will still be progressing for a while no one can say exactly it can take uh, decades through the rest of the century but as you know and if we all know uh, the nuclear um, nuclear event can happen at any moment any moment now um, given the unpredictability and as well as by accident, uh, a false flag and accident anywhere around the world, in the China Sea, in the Ukraine, in Syria, an accident can trigger the unthinkable. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I take it that you, um, you have a broad view on this planet, you know, far exceeding what you do in your studies, in your, in your actual research. Um, are there other aspects of our world that, uh, like the nuclear issue, that really have your attention, that really concern you right now? Well, they are, they definitely are. Um, my field is in airs and with the nuclear during the 1980s. Uh, I was a member of a group called Scientists Against Nuclear Arms. And this went on uh, quite a few years. Uh, but uh, over the last uh, maybe 16 years or so, um, I was mostly uh, preoccupied with a, a climate issue. I, I look at it from the uh, paleoclimate point of view, being essentially a geologist by training. Uh, I look at the deep time uh, perspective, right. and uh, I have studied the uh, studied the great mass extinctions of species. Uh, what's happening now is just as serious, and in some ways even uh, more extreme than some of those uh, mass extinction of species. You know, I, I um, yes, <laughs> yes, I I hear you, and. I appreciate you have an extraordinary kind of a fo singular focus in that way and, a, and a, can put it into the kind of context that we've only seen perhaps from, of course, Elizabeth Colbert in her book of a few years ago, The Sixth uh, Extinction. Um, I'm curious, have you seen this notion of mass extinction? Have you seen changes in that just in the past few years? Oh, definitely. It's happening all the time. Um, if you look at the publications of the um, Wilderness Society and similar, the Sierra Club and so on, uh, species are now getting extinct at rates which are estimated to be 
between 1,000 and 10,000 faster than they have before, the mm -hmm. mass extinction is on. And it's a result of a reduction of habitat spaces, it's a reduction of um, heavy pollution, it's a reduction of other factors such as hunting. Yes, and you know, I, I uh, have a particular focus just in my layman's perspective, and that is um, I've always been a, extraordinarily fond of the ocean. That's where I go for my uh, recharging my inner batteries. And um, it's been absolutely breaking my heart uh, for the past two or three decades now, but especially recently, when we appear to have a number of uh, metrics that are um, extraordinarily uh, urgent, that we're, we're literally killing off the ocean. You know, uh, we're looking at, at the death of, of uh, coral reefs, and in fact, the, the functioning fisheries of the planet before 2050. And I'm curious, is that part of what you're seeing as well? Well, I'm not a biologist, actually. Uh, in my background, I'm a geologist and also mm -hmm. paleoclimate scientist. I read about uh, the uh, current extinction years, and like you, it breaks my heart. Yeah. Uh, I mostly look at events today, like I was saying before, in a deep time perspective. And when you look at the scale and the rate of what's happening, it belongs to the unthinkable. It's uh, perhaps an order of magnitude faster mm -hmm. than the last extinction um, 56 million years ago. And uh, just as uh, huge as what happened um, when Nasser hit out difference than when the asteroid hit the Earth, which is 66 million years ago, things happened within seconds and minutes. Now they happen within, well, maybe two centuries or so on, but it's still a lot faster than a, um, a previous extinction event. Now, you know, I, I recall in your earlier interview, you spent a little bit of time talking about the that that kind of accelerated timeline in terms specifically of uh, Arctic methane and uh, the release factor in that. And, you know, I'm curious first, if you wouldn't mind just um, saying a little bit about what you're aware of in terms of what's, what's going on in the Arctic and how is that, that seems to be one of the most bold examples of exponential uh, increase in temperature, in methane release, and so on. Uh, I'd be very curious what you're seeing, and especially in terms of the uh, relative acceleration. That's right. Uh, well, the Arctic is warming uh, faster, uh, two or three times faster than the average of the rest of the world, which is because of the change in uh, albedo and reflection. As ice melts, uh, uh, infrared radiation radiation is absorbed by open water, and so it melts more ice, and uh, so the cycle goes on. It's warming by several degrees, uh, average three or four, but in place the time warms by much more, ten degrees. Now the Arctic, uh, uh, North and Canada, and also the seabed contains many hundreds of billions of tons of methane. And methane has a, a stronger greenhouse effect than carbon dioxide by about 25 or so. Yeah. Although it changes with time. Uh, the danger is, and already methane is um, being released, already there are uh, leaks and craters uh, through Siberia, large parts. Yeah. It's happening now. Yeah. It's happening now, <laughs> and the potential for release of, even if it was just a small percent of the uh, buried uh, organic matter, which contains methane, even a small percent would uh, release uh, enough greenhouse gas to the atmosphere to exceed the collapse melting point of the large glaciers. We are looking at a fundamental shifts in the state of the of the planet, in the state of the habitable planet. 
The planet, of course, has always survived, but here we're talking about the biosphere. It's uh, already uh, very serious, and the potential is such that, um, I switch my mind off to think about the ultimate consequences, yeah. but at the same time, I don't like to worry people. Uh, life has always been for the present, in the present, not about the past or the future. And I don't like to use language and terms which uh, scare people to the effects that they just, they just cannot continue. That's not what I wish to do. So I try and stick to the scientific evidence, hoping that people will uh, be able to draw the um, conclusions. Sure. I can appreciate that, and I, I understand and respect that. I, I'm curious. Um, I've just recently released my first book last summer called The Impossible Conversation, and it it is it's really a story of how i learned how to learn about climate change just to try and get my head around this uh, extraordinary data that um that i ran into about 3 years ago about abrupt and uh in the middle of my research and so on preparing to to put together that book I ran into a number of climate scientists that um, it was obvious to me, even though I'm, I'm absolutely a layman, I am no scientist whatsoever, but I could tell that they were being extraordinarily conservative in the words that they were choosing to use. For instance, talking about methane release in the Arctic and so on, they were um, extraordinarily um, self governing in their conversation, watchful of every word that they would say. And I eventually asked them about it, and it wasn't just what you were saying, your concern for people and their reactions, their, their heartfelt reactions, but also there seems to be a lot of pressure on scientists in the USA right now, and for some time now, to really um, uh, alter or change uh, what they would say publicly and even sometimes in what they'll report in their findings in order to um, s stay in the good graces of the people that write the checks for their, for their positions. You know, that's, um, and it, that really shocked me. It really shocked me to find out that there was that much pressure on these scientists to not, um, not rock the boat, not uh, upset the status quo. I'm curious if you are aware of that kind of influence there in Australia or anywhere else? Oh, I'm very aware of it. Uh, most of the pressure, well, at least in my case, does not come from outside, it comes from inside. Uh, I don't like to cloud people's day. It's not something I wish to do, in fact. So, uh, I'm trying to talk about the evidence, but I'm not trying to moralize or preach or lecture. Yeah. Uh, I think the role or the duty, the duty of the scientist is to report the evidence. It's yeah. very much the situation with uh, medical doctors, oncologists. Uh, even if they know that the patient has no future, they don't want to stress this point too much uh, to the yeah. family. It's uh, very similar, and similar ethics come into it. In my case, uh, in a way, I'm fortunate in that my geological background uh, leads me to think in deep time terms. Now, in deep time terms, there have been mass extinctions. It's the way of nature. But also, when you look at the species, any which can um, invent sources of energy, such as uh, combustion, such as uh, radiation, such as the nuclear splitting of the atom, any species which has been intelligent enough to develop them will have to be perfectly wise and perfectly in control to try and uh, keep these um, powers from uh, getting out of control. So, in uh, philosophical terms, where can we find a species which 
absolutely why is it perfect? It's impossible. We are not. We are not. So once they, you can say Pandora box has been open. I'm sure you know about Pandora's box. Yeah. Once it's been opened, once we have invented what we have invented, the um, possibilities, probabilities of accidents or design are there, and we are looking at the consequences. So when you look at it in such a deep time perspective, uh, it's not easier to accept what's happening, but at least it's more understandable. Yeah, I I don't mean to spend too much time here, but I, I wanted to just go as a slightly different route. When I'm talking about the, the scientists that I met and interviewed in order to put my book together, I, I was um, particularly shocked that it wasn't just that they didn't want to uh, alarm people. That was not their only motivation. It was that the, the powers that be, the economic and governmental powers that be are, um, especially in the States now, and it sounds like the same thing in Australia, that there is um, not much interest in the corporate or the governmental level to hear any disturbing news, anything that threatens to slow down the economic progress of a country. You know, I think, for instance, of the huge uh, coal mining projects going on, and I believe it's Queensland, there in Australia, and um, the projects promise to do tremendous environmental damage on their own before the coal is even burned, not to mention uh, having massive destruction occur on the Great Barrier Reef. and. Um, those corporate and government uh, forces are clearly pushing ahead the project against every conceivable measure from the scientific community of how detrimental it is. So I'm, I'm just curious, am I seeing it right for that particular example? And are you, are you in agreement with that? You are 100% correct, my friend. Yeah, one hundred percent. I talk with uh, people um, in Parliament uh, have done so for years. Uh, many of them know the evidence, know the facts. Yeah, uh, it's very rare that any one of them will have the courage to um, divert from the official lines, from the party policies, to yeah. take a stand. In the good old times, uh, say. Um, culture of Japan, if the king lost, or rather he would fall on his sword. Now people are even, will not say too much just for the fear of losing their um, privileges or position. Yes. Something about lack of courage, but also the reluctance to talk about a subject which is so much bigger than all of us combined. Yes. Uh, there are a lot of factors, economic, political, psychological. Uh, people can easily lose their job and have lost their job. Here. Uh, even years ago, climate scientists have been dismissed uh, already some 20 years ago for um, we're even using the term climate change now is not um, very permissible in some places. Yeah. Yes, it's, uh, it's a large scale. Um, but the one factor that has not been looked at and recently has been highlighted by uh, Professor Clive Hamilton, and when I think about it also, one scientist who has been pointing out to the reticence, which is a terrible reticence yep. of scientists from expressing their view is, uh, of course, you know, James Hansen. Yes. The great James Hansen, he has been, uh, and if you have not talked with him or interviewed him, <laughs> Highly recommend it. Yep. Uh, but uh, when I talk about what Clive Hamilton has published, you see, people by and large have a huge blind spot to the um, connection relations of humanity with nature. We talk in most of the 
fields of knowledge and sciences in history, in literature, in philosophy, in law, in economics, in politics, and so goes. We talk about relation between people, other individuals, other groups of people, or uh, nations. But less, much less so about the connection, relation, dependence between people and nature. So even intelligent people and conscientious people, they still talk about the climate issue in terms of um, relation between nations, government decisions, uh, no. and so on. But really, they are uh, not focusing on the evidence which scientists do, on evidence for our uh, relationship with with nature itself. Yeah, nature has been somehow uh, done to the sidelines, but nature is coming back now. Nature now is responding to what uh, humanity is doing, and of course you know about the guy McPherson what he says. Yes, I mean I don't like the language and terms he uses. Uh, not at all. I don't like these terms. I, I use only scientific terms, but any person will draw the conclusion from the science, which I think is possibly the best way, yeah. to go around and say the world is ending is really, it's a biblical type of, uh, again, I think it's always been about the present. Uh, my parents lived through World War II, uh, my grandparents lived through World War I, uh, and they still survived because they had Hope. hope is essential, whether it's uh, supported by evidence or not. You can't do that hope. I don't want to say things which remove any hope. And in yeah. fact, there is hope. Uh, we can talk about it later, but if humanity decided to invest the trillions, which it invests in war, military and war, if humanity decided to invest in carbon dioxide drawdown, sequestration, there would have been a certain chance, uh, no one can say how much of a chance, but if they put this enormous dose into carbon dioxide drawdown, it would prevent the Earth, possibly, hopefully, prevent it from growing much faster and possibly even reverse the trend. Well, I, I sure appreciate you bringing up the, the concept of hope. And I'm, I'm wondering if it would be okay to stop there for a moment and just explore together, because um, this, is, this is one very important part of the work that uh, my partner, uh, Carolyn Baker, and I do in our work with people trying to bring empowering tools and uh, expansion of capacities to people who are trying to face this future. And the hope is is obviously right in the center of that, and I'm um, I'm curious uh, when you use the word hope. I'm curious what you're meaning, and if I may, I'd like to just tell you a little bit about the the various definitions that we bumped into. Um, when I hear the word hope um, in my many many conversations with people about this this whole topic, more often than not, they're meaning something like, gee, I hope the experts find some answers to these pesky problems that we have going on so that we can get back to business and life as usual. So <clears throat> that's, um, it's probably a little bit unfair of me to put it that casually, but it seems pretty accurate in my experience. I'm wondering if that's uh, familiar, is that similar to what you've heard people meaning when they say the word hope, or is there something different? Yes, that's right, that's right. I see hope is life, and life is hope. You wouldn't get up in the morning if you didn't have a degree of hope yeah. for being able to live through the day. You would stay in bed. I, uh, so mm -hmm. to me, life is possible without hope. Right. Uh, it's inherent in it. But of course, when people lose it, well, <laughs> some 
thing happens. Uh, to have to thank whether thank God or thank nature for being able to live even for one day, to have a sense of reverence towards nature or in some case towards God, and yes, be thankful for the gift of life of one day, to me is very central. So, part regardless of what happened in the past, very terrible things, and what happening now and happening in the future, I like to uh, be thankful for the one day. Now, you probably know, in the worst situation in wars or in the concentration camps, there were people who had what I call an optimistic gene. Yeah. They had a life power which allowed them to survive, whereas other people did not. Yeah. So, to me, personally, when I think in deep time terms that we're living at times when the consequences of a species that has invented, mastered enormous powers is unable to control, and that and combined with the concept of life for the moment, for the day, it allows me to go on despite of the understanding and knowledge that we are not traveling through major tipping points. Uh, I must have sent you this uh, article. Yes. The tipping points, whether it's in the Arctic, whether it's the hurricanes in the um, uh, tropics, uh, whether it's the um, huge fires which happen in several parts of the world, including California, the heat waves, uh, all these factors combined and now tell us this is a classic tipping point uh, of no turn of the climate driven to a point where in the past, for geological history, well, certainly of the last million years or so, when temperature rose during the interglacial periods, when temperature rose more than one degree, there was a freeze, what's called a study. The freeze results from the flow of ice cold water from the big glaciers into the oceans. Uh, and this cools up the continents around, the, especially the North Atlantic. That's called a study. And what's very likely to happen is rather than continuing smooth rise in temperatures, we're going to have an uh, increase in variability. Uh, very likely to be such a freeze for who knows how long, maybe uh, tens of years, maybe centuries, which will result in a, a mini ice age, and then warming will continue because carbon dioxide keeps on accumulating. So the concepts uh, which even uh, well-informed people have about global warming, and which have been introduced by the International Panel for Climate Change, uh, must be looked at, uh, taken into account that we're going to look at periods of not just smooth warming, but we're going to look at periods of enormous disruptions, both by uh, hot fronts, tropical fronts, and by uh, ice uh, snowstorms. Mm, yeah, I, I get it. I, I definitely get it. If, uh, with your permission, I'd like to just uh, jump back to the the topic you you covered so beautifully before because you you mentioned a couple of words when you were talking about hope a uh, couple of words that i think reflected your particular stance about hope and about daily life and i, I just wanted to um, offer you uh, another person's perspective because i i really appreciated very much you brought in the word i think it was reverence and um, and uh, it, what you seem to be doing was implying a, um, a particular presence that that you apparently have as you look into your day and look into this future, and assuming that other people are having it. And I I guess I would like to do a reality check with you. You could tell me about wherever it is you travel or wherever you're familiar with, and obviously Australia, and I can tell you about. Uh, in my experience of here in the states is that there there actually is not much in the way of uh, the kind of presence and the kind of reverence that you were talking about and um, you know I, I was uh, I, I said that that phrase about hope that it was a bit casual and probably not fair but um, about 
gee, I hope we get back to business as usual as soon as possible. And that really is what I see the vast majority of, for certain, the American public to be in that mode. And there's, there's extraordinarily little um, apparent consciousness, like you're describing, of, of a sense of reverence or a sense of being present to the miracle that it is we're, that we're alive. I'm curious if you have a sense of that kind of the public at large in Australia or elsewhere? Yeah, thanks for asking this question. A very important question. Uh, my own individually a sense of reverence towards the earth and nature, it's expressed mostly in books of poetry which I've written, or two books. And I will be happy to send you copies of these books if you give me your address. That's where I express my feelings, my humanity. Uh, I try and keep my science somewhat separate from that because science has to be well as objective as possible. So you're asking me whether I see it in other people. Yes, I do. Many, many, many individuals who uh, are deeply uh, agonized by the situation, not just by the climate, climate and nuclear, the war, in different parts of the world. There are people who are deeply agonized. How they express it and to what extent it flows into uh, public opinion, they must, uh, I'm not at all sure. You look at this uh, enormous uh, carnival and sports event and gambling and mass tourism around the world and, you know, all the public phenomena which dominates the media. And you don't find this sense of reverence. Uh, you will find this, um, some kind of leave now and pay later. Uh, so on the mass scale, on the media scale, uh, I do not see it. But when yeah. you meet individual people, you very often, very often come across it. Good. I'm I'm so relieved to hear you say that. And I I know to be fair that I know quite a few people who have that kind of reverence in their heart. Um, but like you said, on, on the larger scale, it can be very discouraging. Yeah. Yes, it's it drowns it, this uh, sense of love and reverence of nature creation. They, they drown uh, in this. I often think about our civilization, particularly the Western one, in perspective of Roman civilization. I wonder how the Romans, they conquered the known world, then they destroyed uh, much of the forest, they destroyed a lot of the tribes, and a smaller civilization there. Uh, they sacrificed people in the Colosseum uh, on the scale of hundreds of thousands and more. How did they uh, perceive the world? How did they feel? I often wonder because uh, Historical perspective is, of course, important. Yeah. Now, I'm curious. That's something I've given quite a bit of thought to also. And I'm wondering, um, I, I'm stopped short of what you just said, because it, this seems like a time like no other. It really does seem like the stakes are much higher now than at any other time in human history. Can you, can you set me straight on that? Yeah, well, that's how it is. You've, um, you pinned it down. Mm. You hit the nail on the head. Uh, in the future, survivors, and I hope there will be survivors, they will see us, and particular powers to be the leaders, as having committed the biggest crimes which have ever committed on Earth. Yeah. Uh, it is a mass extinction of species. Uh, I can't see that civilization will survive it, but I hope, I hope that some people can in some remote part of the world. You never know. You cannot. You don't have crystal balls, but whether some people will survive in uh, oh, northern latitudes, in high mountains, uh, in some 
Pacific volcanic islands uh, above the level of sea level rise, because sea level rise is now committed to be, oh, I'd say it's committed to be five meters, but as time goes on, it can be much more than that, which means the cradles of civilization on coastal and low river valleys will be inundated with salt water. That's right. But let me see, you've asked me, sorry, I'm trying to think about the specific question you asked me now. Yeah, well, I guess I was just uh, letting you know that I, I, I want to take a historical perspective. I, I have curiosity about how past civilizations have looked at their own collapse. But I'm, I'm just curious if perhaps there's, perhaps there's not that much to learn from them now because the stakes are so high that it seems like we are, um, you know, we're facing an ending where they faced massive transition. And I, I think that's, um, that's an important difference. I assume that you know, you have read the book, I Gerald Diamond Collapse. Uh-huh. That's, a, that's about the collapse of the civilizations uh, yeah. going back to the um, medieval warm period, um, to the um, Incas, the Aztecs, uh, going back to the North American Indian. Uh, it's going to Easter Island uh, yeah. and so on. And it's a classic book. It's a classic book that I recommend you read. The people at the time, the collapse, whether it was very sudden due to uh, large volcanic eruptions or so, but more likely they have been gradual and to a large extent uh, due to the cutting of the forests. That uh, uh, major droughts have set in and uh, yeah. uh, just agriculture collapsed. But yeah, uh, there are examples there now. Comparison with now, yes, now it's global. Mm -hmm. That, well, because it's the composition shift and change in the composition of the atmosphere and of the oceans, which are becoming acidified and warm. This uh, will touch, is touching just about every part of the Earth. So, And we are aware of it. We're watching it on TV. Our communication now is such that, well, it is a true global village. In the past, whatever happens in other parts of the world, people might or might not have been aware of, but now we can't escape it. Yeah. We can't escape this knowledge now. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, I, I'm i so curious. I'm sorry, if my, I'm sorry if what I say is, yeah, I'm Go sorry ahead. if what I say is, is depressing, but... Oh, that's... I, unfortunately, you and I both know that uh, the news does not look so good, but I, I'm hearing in you a similar thread that's in myself and, and again, my uh, creative partner, Carolyn Baker, where the, beneath the surface, the, if the surface is our fear and our despair and our depression, um, beneath that surface in every person that I've worked with around this topic, there is a deep love of life that I think you were pointing to when you talked about the word reverence and the kind of presence you were describing that you bring to each day. And um, again, without that, you know, perhaps that has something to do with m my uh, definition of hope to be able to touch into the humanity and the life, the miracle of life underneath the surface of our busy world and our despair and, and our um, denial and so on. Um, that's what truly keeps me getting out of bed in the morning is, is to be able to touch the, the purity and the beauty of, of each moment as best I can there's a there's a certain there's a word that I'm not a religious person, but there's a, a word that I've spoken with a lot of religious scholars about the word called grace, 
And um, I've been lucky enough to experience quite a bit of grace. And I, I think that's available to every one of us at every minute. But it's so easy to forget and it's so easy to lose touch in our busy, busy world. Yes, it's, it's all very true. I feel very much the same way as you do. Mm. Mm. Uh, in a way, I think two different lines. One, it's optimism or pessimism is irrelevant. We just look at the evidence and mm. from a scientific point of view, with the exception of uh, drawing down carbon dioxide, which is a choice that humanity has, yeah. and which could work. There's no guarantee, but it could work. Uh, with the exception of this uh, possibility, uh, the science uh, tries to point out to the realities of our lives and the world. But the other part of me is, uh, I, is a, not just a scientist, but also my poetry. Mm. I just uh, uh, have a sense, deep sense of reverence towards the earth and its creatures. Yeah. Uh, just about the um, grieve about the um, birds and about well, <laughs> all ki other kinds of lives as I do about our own uh, humanity. And so that part of me, which I express mostly through poetry, through poems. Uh, this part is grieving. Uh, the scientific part is, is trying to look at uh, just the word that it is. And then yet another part says, be thankful for a day's life. The butterfly only lives for one day. Just be grateful for awareness, a sense of awareness for one day, and don't ask for, for any more. So the hours is really different uh, streams of sentiments which um, each one has a uh, truth in its own right mm. oh, beautifully said beautifully said well I, I um, <laughs> we've gotten to a place I had no idea we would touch because uh, you know I, I include so much of the <clears throat> the mythopoetic world in order to find my heart in this in these troubled times and i'm so so pleased that you do the same and i'm wondering if you it would be okay if um what i'm planning on doing is i'll post this this interview and uh and i'm happy to send you the link if it's useful and and we can do that and then if there's a way to connect with some of your poetry, I could then go back and uh, add, as uh, it, with your permission, I could add a poem or two if you had a cho you know, a, a particular poem or two that you would like to be included in this recording. I could then post it fresh with whatever uh, poetry you would like added to our interview today. Yes, certainly. Uh, my poems are both published as hard copies, which I can send you, but they're also online, uh, which means uh, they are as electronic files, PDFs. Uh, I can send you these PDFs within a, the next even five minutes, though. Oh, that's right. And uh, as to the ones... Yeah. Great. And yeah. as to the ones selected, yes, I can, I can recommend. I can recommend maybe two or three poems which I particularly like. I would absolutely appreciate that. You know, um, I, I know I said it at the beginning, but I'd like to just, um, as we're, we're um, approaching the end of the envelope of our, of our speaking to get today, I, uh, perhaps it's in the same light that you were just saying about appreciating each day uh, and perhaps each interaction as best we can, um, there's something extraordinary about being able to speak with you, uh, a, a person who has as much knowledge of what I tend to call the sober data, the, uh, you know, basically the facts of what's going on out there. And, uh, 
And even though you have that knowledge, um, you find a way to keep your heart open and to keep yourself engaged with life. And um, I just find that deeply inspiring. So I, I thank you for that. You know, I really appreciate your comments and insights here. And, uh, and vice versa, I, I appreciate your uh, insight and outlook as well. Yeah. It takes two sometimes. <laughs> yeah, it does. <laughs> um, I, I guess I just have a couple more questions for you, and I'm, uh, I'm also open if you have any questions for me. Um, I'm wondering if you have anything that has recently come to your attention that that has really got you concerned and in addition to whatever we're talking about um. well yes uh, i mean until uh, 2009 there was an impression that uh, actually um, humanity come to terms or come to grips with what's happening then came the Copenhagen conference, which we had enormous hopes for. But after that, things started to go downhill. Um, so the concern was there all along, of course. Well, in the nuclear, which I see is just as serious and closely related. Um, so the concern has been there for a very long time. But something which came up recently well, I'd say there is now what I call a silence, a uh, high degree of cover-up. Uh, for example, one can hardly publish now in many, many uh, media channels, and there are very few platforms now for climate scientists to continue to um, point to the evidence. Yeah. Uh, where a lot of platforms were, in fact, the media and even the political classes were quite open to uh, listen to what scientists had to say before 2009. Now, well, I still publish in places uh, such as Counter Currents and the similar progressive journals, but uh, even the more progressive uh, outlets uh, are now they suffer from what I say, climate fatigue. You can, you can beat up that drum, even if it's true, and it's true, and it's true, but you can beat it for so long before people just switch off. Yeah. They want to go back to daily life. They have to put bread on the table. Uh, the issue is so daunting, it's, it's beyond human power, beyond, even beyond human imagination. And uh, so all which I can do, and I think it's a duty of science to do it, is just keep pointing to the evidence with a hope, but it's not not degree of optimism that perhaps, well, I think in a way Guy McPherson was correct when he says nature bets, bets us. Yeah. People will become fully aware when uh, the natural, uh, or rather the extreme weather events hit even stronger than they already have, uh, I'm afraid at that stage it could be too late. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for that. I, unfortunately, I agree. Um, this, the second and perhaps final question, um, I'm wondering if, is there anything that's, that's occurred in, in uh, locally or globally recently that is encouraging to you? Well, what is encouraging potentially is that the technology has developed so fast for alternative energy and even draw down, carbon draw down, that at least in principle, as a possibility exists, to have a major try to um, to rectify mm. what uh, has already occurred. Yeah. Uh, only if human attitudes 
have switched from, from wars, and really, these are genocidal wars. Uh, these are totally, totally dark yeah. wars of no justification, whatever. Uh, it's just, in my view, it just keeps on. The two major industries in the world are the uh, fossil fuel industry and the uh, industrial, the industrial complex. They thrive on uh, what is happening now. And they have their own vested interest, and uh, the expenses, the trillions which go into them, come at the expense of protecting life on Earth. Yeah. They claim to be defense industries, but really, they're the opposite. And the only two defense now will be to try and uh, protect nature, what's left of it. Um, our so-called leaders... Um, Either have no courage, either have knowledge but no courage, or, or, um, or mercenary hired uh, by the Western interest. Yeah. So here we are moving into the politics, into the politics of the matter, and that's all global. Yeah. It's um, certainly true in the Western countries, but it's also true in other parts of the world. Uh, uh, still, I always come back to life the present for myself, and if I knew what could be done, <laughs> if I only knew. Yeah. But um, it's an evolutionary stage. Uh, I always come back to that. If a species uh, harness powers greater than its uh, degree of wisdom and control to be able to control, to limit, then uh, it is an objective uh, Evolutionary development. Uh, we have done that. We have power to destroy. We have power to try to save. But somehow we don't seem our species doesn't to have wisdom and responsibility and control to them to do it. But I'm always always happy to be proven wrong. Always happy to to be supported. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, I I have this <laughs> I have this uh, dual experience right now. I have the experience on the one side of having a very sobering and very um, uh, difficult con side of the conversation with you and. Um, Professor Andrew Glickson from Australian National University, earth and paleoclimate scientist, and obviously a heartful, heartful poet. I also get your, um, your love of life and your um, meaning to do the right thing with your expertise in the world and with your presence in the world. And uh, it's just been a... Um, it has it has been a mixed conversation, and it's been a delightful conversation and a very very inspiring conversation. And I I want to thank you so much for speaking with me today. I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, convey myself and my feelings. And it's very nice meeting you on the airways. Yeah. Um, Yes, I will appreciate. I will appreciate the link of this conversation, and I will send you the. Um, uh, poetry books, both electrically and as hard copies. I will need to know your um, mailing address for that. Great. Well, thank you so much. And uh, I will be more than happy to uh, follow your direction in terms of choices for uh, some poetry that I can include in this particular um, interview and in the recording and, and posting of that. And uh, thank you so much for your generous offer. I, I look forward to reading your poetry, and thank you so much for your bringing that on top of your expertise. It's uh, it's a real gift. Yes, yeah, thank you, Dean. It's nice meeting you, even though on the airwaves. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm going to uh, I'm going to hit the off button now for a recording. So if you just hang on for one moment. Thanks for watching another episode of the Poetry of Predicament podcast produced by Dean Walker and the Living Resilience Alliance, www.livingresilience.net. You may want to check out our sister podcasts, the 
new Lifeboat Hour with Carolyn Baker on Podbean and at carolynbaker.net. Also, the Impossible Conversation podcast, another channel on YouTube. Thanks so much for joining us. Join us again later for another episode of The Poetry of Predicament.